We're going to begin at Psalm 67. You can turn there in verse 1. It's going to be in the Message Bible. We just have just two, two literally sentences in that verse. As you're turning there, I want to encourage you that we have a big night this Wednesday night. So I'm going to say Wednesday night. It's dedicated one night this Wednesday night. Now, what is dedicated one night? It's, it's, a, it's a great night for all youth. That's middle school, high school, and young adult. And Pastor Daniel and his team, we do this once a month, and it's basically a conference-style night. So you need to get your young person here. If you're a young adult, come check it out. It's amazing. Great worship. Interactive things happening. Great word. And uh, we're, we're getting close to no, almost 500 people now. Come on, on a Wednesday night for dedicated one night. Yeah. And I believe this year is going to be even a greater breakthrough year. Because I believe it's a mandate in our church to reach the young people. Okay, so, so uh, and if you say, man, I would love to be a part of something like that. I would love to serve in that ministry of uh, the dedicated uh, youth. Man, then what you need to do is you go through Grow Track. And once you go through Grow Track in step four, they're going to have all their people representing different ministries. And Pastor Daniel will have somebody, if not himself. And he'll tell you what it's like to join and be a part of really reaching young people. I was a youth pastor for many years, and I love young people still. In fact, this coming week, I'm going to be preaching uh, at Jesus Culture Youth Conference, and there'll be 4,000 young people there. So I'm preaching this weekend at Jesus Culture, and I'm excited. Then next weekend, I'm preaching to 5,000 young people in Portland, Oregon. So here's the thing. I still love young people. Now, I don't know why they're asking an old guy to come, because at one time I was the young guy, but I think they need more like a father figure to come. But I don't know what. But, but our heart at this church is we need to reach the young people. Okay, so, so if the lights and the music and all that, it's like if you're a little bit older, you say, man, we got to reach the young people. We got to reach your grandkids. Come on, help me, somebody. We, we got to reach your, your young adults. We need to reach them. Okay, because if we don't, 10 years from now, we're just going to be a bunch of old people. You say, what's wrong with being old people? You're old. I'm old. Okay. One thing that, the reason why we need young, I'm going to take a little time because I just feel a grace on this. The reason why we need the young people is because they give us older people, come on, some life and energy. And the reason why, listen, we need older people in our church is because we need to give wisdom and insight to the younger generation. So what the enemy has done, listen, what the enemy has done is he's, he always tries to pit generations against each other because he's afraid of unity. He's afraid that if young people flood a church, there'll be so much energy in life. And he's afraid that if older people embrace it and just say, you know what? No, we're going to go with it. He's afraid that you're going to pour in wisdom and insight to the younger generation. And he's afraid because he says, the Bible says one will put a thousand, but two will put 10,000 to fly. So I want to raise up a church, come on, and I hope you're with me, that reaches all generations so we can bring glory and honor. Come on, every generation, put your hand together right now and put it strong right now. Come on. So that's why we do dedicate a one night. So get here, all of you, and then those of us that are not in that younger generation, we also have a prayer meeting that's going to be taking place. So I'm asking 150 people to come. We're going to pray for one hour. It's going to be worship, prayer, worship, prayer. It'll be the best hour you ever had right over here. Don't start my preaching time yet, guys. Reset that. It's not my preaching time. Ain't my preaching time. Oh, no, no, no. That's right. No, no, no. Y'all thinking, oh, man, this part, no, not pre pre preaching time. No, this, this, is, this is like overtime right now. I'm just telling you right now. Like that great game. Did you watch that football game yesterday? Did my Arizona Cardinals pull it off? And my man, Larry Fitzgerald, where did he come from? That's so awesome. So let me just, just, just throw it out there. Who is a Seahawk fan before we can read the scripture? Who's a Carolina Panther fan? And who don't care? Just let me see your hand. You, you, you don't. I'm in, the right, I'm in the right church right now. Praise the Lord. My brother-in-law, Judas Smith, I think is canceling service because the Seahawks are playing, you know. I wonder when he, when he shows up to Jesus, I wonder what he's going to say to Jesus. Russell Wilson was. Uh, 
Psalm 67 verse 1 says, God mark us with what? And what? Come on, say a little bit louder. Now, look, all the back of houses are afraid to start my time now. You can start my time now. You can start my time. I can't fire you. You're volunteers. Here we go. And so to say, God, mark us with what? And what? See, I want to believe that this prayer that took place literally thousands of years ago is a prayer we don't have to pray anymore. Because if you're a follower of Jesus, that prayer has been answered. So I take this verse and I say, Lord, I thank you that you have marked Benny Perez's life. Come on, somebody, with grace. Come on, and with blessing. Because here's what's going to happen in life. Life is going to mark you. And life is going to mark you with some difficult things, some tragedies, some heartbreak. But don't allow that to mark the rest of your life. Father, thank you that we are marked Lord, as the psalmist said, Lord God, with grace and blessing, and we're going to smile about it. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Thank you. You may be seated. We're in the series called Marked, and uh, Happy New Year to those of you that have not been at church for the first two weekends. We are glad that you are starting your church off, you're starting your year off right in church. And I got to tell you, I think 830 is becoming one of my favorite experiences right now. It's incredible. If you did not see me early in the worship experience and I walked in late, it's because I was in the kids' ministry. And I want to tell you, in the kids' ministry, it is amazing what's going on in there. There's energy. There's life. They're, they're learning about Jesus. And uh, there was a great young man up there leading. His, name had, his last name happens to be Perez, and he was doing a great job. And they were just doing this thing called Word Wars. And, you know, it's basically hangman, but they don't know it. And, and so I, I just said, I, and it's called, it's called Word Wars. It's kind of like a Star Wars theme. And, and they, they were, nobody was getting the letters right. I, I said, hey, what's the, what's, the, what's the word? It's Leia. And so I said, L, 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 Master Jedi says L, you know. And, and, and so, so let me tell you, our children are being taught in a creative way. Come on, the Word of God. They're being marked. Come on, somebody, with the Word of God. Well, as we started this series, we... Uh, begin to think about as a team and a staff, and it was really Omar that came up with this thought about being marked, and, and he had a scripture of the book of Ephesians chapter 1, and it's right there on the wall. You could read it to your right, to my left, how after we believe we've been marked with the seal, the precious Holy Spirit, and I just been to get, begin to think about this, that really all of our lives have been marked in one way or another. I told a funny story how I fought a vicious man-eating wild monkey, and uh, I survived it, and I have 10 stitches on my wrist, and, and people will come up to me probably after this experience and say, hey, can I see your wrist, you know, and to see that mark. But I said this because it's true that all of our lives sitting here, even those that are online right now, all of our lives have been marked in one way or another. I mean, literally, our lives have been marked, and some of them have been great events, and some of us have been marked with some very difficult events. Maybe some of you, your family, you, you come from a divorced family, and that's a hard mark to have when you're a young kid or a young person. Maybe you yourself have been marked with a relationship not working. Maybe you've been marked even last year, and you've been diagnosed with a disease that is very difficult. All of our lives are going to be marked. So it doesn't matter how rich you are, how poor you are, what color skin you are, you, you have, or where you're from or where you live. Everybody has been marked in one way or another. So I begin to talk about this, and today I want to talk to you about being marked by generosity. I begin to think about this being marked by generosity, and all of our lives here have been marked in one way or another with generosity. I mean, you've gone out to dinner, maybe you invited a couple to dinner, and now the bill comes, and this has happened to me frequently, and all of a sudden, I'm like, okay, I take out my credit card because I'm going to pay. And the, per the people that I'm with, they said, we already took care of it. How many of you like that right there? That's a good thing right there, right? That that's generosity. But it's also flipped around the other way. It's like when the bill comes, it's like, you know, nobody's reaching for their credit card. And, in fact, I, I've had this. Oh, man, I was going to pick it up, but I left my wallet at home. Has anybody ever experienced that before? Am I the only one, right? I'm only the one that I went out with Jerome, and he said he left, he forgot his credit card. I mean, it's multiple times over and over again. I'm like, man, Lord, help the man right there. 
but 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 you 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 all know what it's like to be marked by generosity. You know what it's like to be marked by generosity when jo- generosity is extended to you. But I love it when I get the opportunity to extend generosity from me. It is something powerful when uh, during Christmas we get to do the big toy and coat drive. And you see people that would not get any toys. Come on, and your generosity makes a huge difference. I, I want this church, come on, to be marked by generosity. That, 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 that the city of Henderson, the city of Las Vegas, would not, would not want our church to ever, ever shut down because of what we do. Come on, in the Las Vegas Valley. Generosity is a power, powerful thing, so powerful that many of the billionaires that exist today that they want to mark their legacy by giving away most of their money. Facebook guy, Zuckerberg, just said, I want to give away most of my money. I mean, all the great people from Microsoft founder Bill Gates to the great people that have incredible billions of dollars in the stock market say that we want to leave a legacy with generosity. My friends, I'm here to tell you that is innate in every person that's sitting here right now. I think it's innate both watching me now in followers of Jesus and those that are not followers of Jesus because there is a deposit of God in every one of us. And the reason why there's this generosity that's hitting the world right now is because generosity never started in man. It always started in God. God is the originator. Come on. God is the originator. And there might be some people that say, no, it started with this or that. No, it always starts with God. God is the one that starts everything. He is the one that began generosity in the very beginning. So we're going to begin this in the book of 2 Corinthians, and we're going to show you what I mean by this. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10, this great scripture says, for God. Somebody say, for God. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat in the same way. Somebody say, in the same way. God will. Somebody say, God will. God will provide in what? He's going to provide in what? Come on, say it loud. Provide in what? You got up early, so provide in what? Increase. You don't have a hangover. Come on, provide in what? Increase. Your what? Whose resources? God's resources? Your resources. So wait a second. God's going to provide and increase your resources. Stop. That sounds crazy. Wait a second. I thought God was always wanting something from me. But no, it says that God is going to provide and increase whose resources? Somebody say my resources. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, God will increase your resources. Look at your other neighbor and say, neighbor, I don't know about yours. Just tell him that right now. If you, come, if you come to this church long enough, you know what second neighbor is all about. And what's the purpose? And then he will produce a great harvest of what? Of what? Say it louder. Of what? So could it be that the provision and increase is not just for you just to take it all for yourself, but it's pointing for you to be generous? The heart of God is always for his people to be Generous, but let's black this scripture down, and it says, number one, write this down in your notes. God is the beginning of generosity. God is the beginning of generosity, for God is the one. That's what the scripture says, for God is the one. This indicates that God is the source. This indicates that God is the beginner of the process. This lets us know, church, that God is literally, literally the initiator of all things. It reminds me of the very first Scripture in the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says, For in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God. Everything begins with God. Nothing was before him. Nothing will be after him. He is, was, come on, and will be. It means that God is first. In all things, God goes first. He never asks us to do something that he does not do first. God being first means that he is the original source, that he is first. He is the source. He is the beginning. He is the end. There is no, there, listen, there is nobody before God. Who is before God? God. Well, doesn't everything have to have a beginning? Yes, except God. I mean, it's audacious for the Bible say to say, in the beginning, God. It's actually presuming that you believe in him. That, that there is no question to the scripture that it is God. No, it's a big bang. No, before the big bang, there was a big God. 
And I actually don't believe in a Big Bang. I don't believe that out of disorder comes order. I believe that creation points to a designer because there's a design in creation. Everything about your life is designed. Your body is designed. Your eyes are designed. It could not just blow up and you did not come from some protoplasmic stuff coming out of the ocean and evolve over millions of years. No, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, how can you, being an intelligent man, uh, believe in something? Well, how can you, being an intelligent man or woman, believe that it just kind of happened? I'm not walking down the beach of Newport Beach and all of a sudden a Rolex watch rolls up on the shore and say, look what the ocean produced. I'm not walking up into my favorite de uh, car dealership, Lamborghini. Come on, somebody, hurricane. That's what I'm believing God for in Jesus' name. <laughs> I don't walk up into that. And I know they look at me and they go, you can't even buy this car. It's true, but I mean, at least make me believe I can. <laughs> I don't walk in a dealership and say, whoa, look what the dealership produced. No, there was a factory. And out of that factory, there was a designer before that. And now they have these plans. Listen, it, all that stuff, you have to really have more faith to believe in a Big Bang. I don't have time to get into all this stuff, but I actually believe the Bible that said in the beginning, God. Reminds me of another great scripture in John chapter 3, verse 16. It said, for God. For God, look at what 2 Corinthians again, 9, 10 says, for God is the one, and, 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 and now John chapter 3, verse 16 says, for God so loved the world that he, so not only is he the initiator of creation in the world, he gave everything, he gave creation the start, but in the fall of creation, He's coming again, and he's giving something else. He's giving his one and only son. For God, everything begins with God. The beginning of generosity, come on, is God. Number two, write this down. It says God provides, notice the scripture again in verse 10, 2 Corinthians 9, God prov provides both seed and bread. Seed for the farmer, and then bread to eat. God provides seed for farmer. A farmer plants seeds to get a harvest. So watch this scripture, and if we would read verses 6 through 10, you can read it later. This is the context of actually giving. And now the writer, which is Paul, is actually trying to relate to the Corinthians because it's an agricultural society, and he begins to talk about sowing seed and reaping a harvest. He, he, he's, he's trying to get them to understand that, watch, a farmer takes seed. Now, work with me, okay? And, he, and a farmer now takes seed, and he plants seed. If, if, and there might be a farmer here, but we're in Las Vegas unless you farm dirt. I mean, like, like, like desert dirt. It, you, you, you don't, you're not driving, like in Iowa, you see all this corn, and, and you go through Nebraska, and, there's all this, and we just drive, and there's dirt, 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 right? And, uh, and so it's all cool with the dirt, but... I kind of like a little bit of green, but so work with, look, work, work with the Bible, work with your pastor. When you take seed and you sow seed, a farmer sows seed because he is believing for a harvest. No, no farmer sows seed and just says, well, whatever come. No, if I plant, watch me, corn seeds, what am I going to get? Corn. If I plant uh, uh, wheat, I'm, uh, wheat seeds, I'm going to get what? Wheat. Okay. Or apple, I'm going to get what? Apple tree. And so what the, what the Bible is saying is God is the one who provides seed for the farmer. So now Paul is saying that, watch, that now everything points back to God. So now God is the one that provides the seed. The farmer doesn't provide the seed. God provides the seed. And so what happens is if we plant a, a handful of seed, we will get a harvest, correct? Yes. Now, if I plant a handful of seed, I will get a probably a pretty small harvest, but now if I plant a, a tractor, a, a big, massive truck full of seed, I'm going to get a bigger harvest, right? So he says this, but it's very interesting what he says. He says that God provides seed 
for the farmer and bread to eat. Now, in chapter uh, 9, verse 6, put that up, please, so they see this. The verse 6 says this. The point is, whoever sows sparingly will also what? And whoever sows or plants a lot will also reap what? Bountifully. So you cannot get away from this fact that what you sow in the amount you sow determines how much you will reap also. It's a universal principle. So let me back it up. This principle is, is, is true whether it's money or whether it's you watch giving out love. The more love you give out, come on, the more love you're going to receive. People say, well, I don't have any friends in the church. I don't have any friends. Have you sowed any friendliness? Okay, that, you didn't like that, so let's go over here. Well, it seems like that, you know, people never forgive me. Are you sowing forgiveness? Because whatever you sow, come on, you're going to reap even bigger. So, so here's the principle, and now he goes on to say, he says, well, God is the one that provides seed for the farmer and also bread to eat. So let me explain to you biblically what this is talking about. It is talking about, in the context here of Scripture, it's talking about finances. Our money, the money that you have, it is literally a seed to sow. That dollar bill, that $10 bill, that represents the seed. You say, well, I know where this is going. I know. I mean, you're going to be talking about sowing, and I'm not into sowing. And I would tell you this, that everybody sitting here watching online, you already are farmers. You are sowing your seed somewhere. Okay, so when I go buy a car, I have sowed a seed. Wherever I now deposit my money, whether it's Target to buy my kids clothes last week, uh, it was a lot, but better at Target. Come on, the Nordstrom, somebody help me now. Right? And so, so I am sewing. When I got my, my road bike fixed yesterday, I'm a geese on Stephanie, which are great guys. I don't get anything for promoting them, but they are amazing. And they said, man, your bike is ready, Mr. Perez. I picked it up, and I sewed $89. I, I took my money, and I sewed it. I, I gave it. And what did you reap? I reaped a bike that has now been fixed, and it's ready for me to take on the Tour de France. So when you, you call it spending, God says sowing. So wherever I sow, now watch me. I just want you to be a farmer that sows in the best soil so you can get the best return for the seed that you have. So now I wrote down that we are sowing in the supermarket. We're sowing in Target. We're sowing in the golf course. We're sowing in the mall. Come on, a.k.a. Wendy. And we're sowing in the family. Come on, we're sowing into friends. Come on, anytime you are distributing your finances, you are a sower. You just need to know what's the best way to sow. So watch. He says, I'm going to give bread to the, I'm going to give seed to the sower and bread to eat. Seed to the sower and bread to eat. Not all your income is to be given away. Some of your income is to be given away. Most of your income is for you to have bread to eat. So when I sow in generosity to World Vision, which we do, when I sow in generosity to Latin American Child Care, which we do, when I sow now to Compassion International, which we do, another child, I think we, I, do, we think, I think we're up to six kids that we are sowing into every month. That, we, that, 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 that's good when I give to God the first part of our income, which is the first part, the 10%, the tithe, as we do that every month. As we do beyond that, as God leads us, we keep doing it. But the majority of my income is not to give away. It's bread to eat. Now, I'm going to believe God, though, that I'm going to get to a point where I, I, God is so incredibly taking care of uh, me and taking care of our church that I believe one day, like J.C. Penney, who said, I'm going to give 90% away and live on 10%. Okay, so, so I believe you can get to that place, but primarily the writer is saying, no, 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 God's not saying give me everything. He's saying, I want you to know something, that the first part of your income, watch me now, is seed to sow. And then the rest of it, come on, is bread to eat. 
So, so notice the order, seed to sow and then bread to eat. I believe this is speaking of us putting God first in our lives. We give to God in his work first, sowing, and then we get to eat our bread. This is what Jesus began to talk about, that God being our provider. We don't have to worry. We don't have to be anxious. In Matthew 6, 30, Matthew chapter 6, he says, he says, look at the flowers. I know there's not many here. <laughs> look at the birds. Not very many here. But, but he's talking to people where there's, literally flowers and, and, and rolling hills, and he's saying, look at all the flowers, and look at all the birds. My heavenly Father takes care of the flowers and the birds, and he says, you are more valuable than they. Then he says, how much more, come on, will your heavenly Father take care of you? So he says this, then seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. I think the greatest lesson I ever learned wasn't how to worship, wasn't how to preach. I'm still learning. Wasn't how to lead a church, still learning. Was my, my, my own dad taught me what it is to put God first in giving. I, 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 I recently read a quote from Billy Graham, one of the most respected men, whether you're a Christian or not, and he said this, quote, if most Christians would learn how to handle their money and put God first, most of their life would work itself out. There is a direct correlation of how you handle your finances and how your life goes. I, I, you say, well, well, if I put God first, I'm get, am I going to become wealthy? I don't believe that everybody's going to become wealthy, but I believe that everybody's going to have their needs met. I believe there's something about trusting God, that God, you're going to give me the bread to eat, that God is going to provide. Look at again, verse, verse uh, 10 and, and 2 Corinthians 9. They'll put that back up for me because I want you to see that. I'm not just making this up. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer, bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide. Somebody say, he's going to provide. Say it louder, he's going to provide. Say, my Father in heaven will provide. Now, 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 provision is that he's going to give you, come on, what you need. But, but I, I would just love this verse if it says, and God will provide, period. But it doesn't, it doesn't stop there. It says God's going to provide and what? Increase. I actually believe the Bible teaches that we are blessed, come on, to be a blessing. I believe that God wants to increase us. I'm going to say something, and, and people say, oh, no, he's a prosperity preacher. And, I mean, oh, he's one of those prosperity guys. And, and you know, you got to be careful about prosperity guys. So the antithesis of prosperity preacher is poverty. So maybe you want me to get up and preach poverty to you. And preach like, you know what, God's not going to provide for you. And if you got money, you're a sinner and you should sell everything. And, and then we get up and say, we want to help the community. How can we help the community if we are in poverty ourselves? I'm going to say this. If God has blessed you financially and God has blessed you with things, don't ever apologize for them. Don't ever back down from them. Don't ever come in sheepishly and say, oh, my goodness, I got to drive my broke down little uh, 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 Toyota or broke down little Hyundai or broke down little Pinto that I saved so I can go to church so people don't judge me. No, my friends, that's a poverty mindset. The devil wants to keep us to think poverty because he knows if, if we believe what God says and have resources, we can change the world. <laughs> no, we can do more camps for kids. We could obliterate hunger. We could tell all the homeless people, listen, there's a church that we can begin to do more for you. I want to declare that God wants to bless you. You should believe it. You should believe that God wants to bless you. Somebody say, I believe God wants to bless us. Say, I believe God wants to bless you. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I believe God wants to bless you. Look at your other neighbor and say, neighbor, you look like you need a blessing. Just tell them about it. And if they say, yep, then reach into your wallet and give them a blessing right now. <laughs> it's amazing how people fight in the church world when people start talking about money and start talking about blessing and start talking about that God wants to prosper. And here's the big pushback. Well, that's just feeding materialism. 
Like, really? Have you ever read your Bible? Maybe you haven't read the Bible. Because the Bible says, clearly God's going to provide and increase your resources. And it says, then produce materialism in you. doesn't say that. It says that God's going to produce generosity in you. Let me help you with materialism. Materialism isn't cured by you earning less. It's cured by you giving more. Okay, somebody needs to write this down for me because it just came to me. Let me repeat that because it's a great quote. Make sure you put at Benny Perez when you put it up on social media. Okay? Materialism, materialism excuse me, because I had, I had um, oral surgery and it's just jacking with my mouth. So if I'm, I'm not going to like have a, like a stroke or something up here. I'm just, I'm just, my mouth is just freaking out. I'm be healed in Jesus' name. Um, so materialism is not cured by you earning less. In fact, I know a lot of people that are barely making, that are really poor, that are more materialistic than very wealthy people. Let me tell you what happens if you don't get materialism under control, and now the way that you get it under control is not earning less, it's by giving more. You will now win a lotto and have all the money you could imagine and be broke five years from now. Because, listen, the Bible does not teach poverty it teaches stewardship. So why would God entrust you with a million dollars if you can't take care of 48,000? Why would God entrust you with 100,000 if you can't take care of, come on, 36,000? God is a stewardship God. I, I, I run this church with the executive team and with our executive pastor and other executive pastors, and we will not entrust to one of our pastors more in their portfolio if they can't handle what they have right now. It, 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 it's, it's, it's illogical. I will not allow my kids and give them more responsibility and more resources that they cannot handle. Come on, what I give them right now. So, I, so BJ... Uh, gets $10 a week for work. Ben Benaya and Bella gets $5 a week for work. If they don't do their job, they don't get paid the full amount of money. It's just, just the way we roll. And so the last couple of weeks, they haven't gotten their full uh, pay. And they say, well, wait a second, Dad. You're supposed to pay us this much. I said, yes, if you do the work. We, we're not allowance people. I'm not going to give you, because you don't get an allowance out there. You don't just show up and say, give me my allowance. Now, let me help you out. If you, if you work someplace that has the mentality, I want to get hired. I want to work part-time there. I'm here. Where's my allowance? Okay, you don't like what I'm saying. Because the government is not your source of supply. I'm not against government helping those, and we were one of them. I know what it is to pay with food stamps. They don't give food stamps anymore. They give these fancy credit cards. Okay? So if you're on, government says don't feel bad, but I don't think you should live there the rest of your life. I think you have creativity in you. I think there's an idea in you. I think God has something for you. And what would happen if we begin to think like, you know what, no, I'm not going to be somebody who sucks life out of a system. I'm going to be somebody that puts life back into a system. And what would it be like if we begin to think like entrepreneurs? That's sitting right here, I feel annoyed. Sitting right here, I declare there's millionaires and billionaires that are sitting right here. I believe it's going to happen in your generation. I believe your sons and daughters, I believe they're going to be successful. I believe they're going to have great careers. I believe they're going to be great in sports and creative and in movies and acting. I believe that our church is going to produce people that are going to change the world. Come on, clap your hands real strong for me right now. Pastor, it sounds like you're a Republican. I'm not, I'm not espousing Republican ideas or Democrat ideas. I am a Christian. Hmm. Number three. God provides the grace in our giving, the grace in our generosity. Look at verse 8 of 2 Corinthians 9. 
he says this. What a great verse. And God. Somebody say, and God. Isn't it interesting that the, the verse in the same context, verses 6 through 10, it, it's always about God. For God is the one, right? And, and God is able. God is able to make what? All grace abound to, to you. So that having watch, all sufficiency in all times, in all things, at what? At all? Notice, grace produces all sufficiency in all things. Come on, in, at all times that you may abound. Come on, in every good work. So God is able to make the abundance of grace. And how, how, how do you do that? Well, you have to go back to last week because it says in the book of Romans, chapter 5, that through Christ, through Jesus, he has given us the abundance of grace. Come on, in the gift of righteousness. What is grace? Grace is God giving you the power and desire to do his will. Grace is unmerited favor. G grace is, man, God says, because of Jesus, I'm going to do things for you. I know you're not perfect. I know you didn't did it all right, but my son did it all right. And when you put your faith and trust in my son and recognize that you're in Christ, blessings come to you simply because you're in Christ. So he's going he's gonna to create this this energy, this life in you that you're going to have now, watch, all sufficiency. The word sufficiency means adequate resources within. Adequate resources within. I can be encouraged by people. I can't depend on them. I only depend on God, and I can be encouraged by people. People say, well, wait a second, you know, the church and the pastor didn't do this. Listen, God says, I've given you all sufficiency so that all the adequate resources are within you. Jesus says, don't you know that the kingdom of God is within you? Don't you know the Holy Spirit, come on, lives within you? And the reason why we have a community of faith is, yes, to encourage one another, to help each other, to be there for each other. But if for some reason it doesn't happen, you still have a God that says, I am El Elohim. I am the God above all gods. I am the sufficient one. And you don't have to look to the right or to the left. You can look up because if you look up and trust Jesus, he will make a way for you. God says, I will empower you in generosity. I will empower you in your giving. This grace begins to flow towards you. This grace is given towards you through Jesus Christ. Now listen, this does not mean that every Christian will be wealthy in material things, but it does mean that, that the Christian that practices grace giving, that understands that God is the one who provides, that God is the one that increases, will always have what he needs when he needs it. I want to believe that everybody here, that God's going to increase even your resources. But, but, but there are certain people that have this grace upon them that they can handle incredible wealth. Not everybody can handle incredible wealth. You say, well, wealth destroys people. Only those that don't have the grace of God on their life. See, so, so I didn't grow up. I, I grew up in a, in a blue-collar family. I don't believe there's any more significance in white collar, blue collar. Okay, I grew up in a middle class, hardworking family like a lot of us did. Grew up in a city called Pico Rivera, California, which is now still about 98% Hispanic. Okay, so when I go home with my wife and uh, we go to Target, they're looking at her. <laughs> and they're looking at me. And then when they look at my kids, they can't figure it out. Come on. <laughs> uh, so I grew up in a hardworking family. My dad worked 17-hour days. He ended up becoming a millwright and worked hard and, and really worked hard. Like sometimes he'd work three weeks straight and not take a break. And he'd work 17-hour days. There were, and it's not exaggeration. My dad would sometimes go 20-hour days, literally sleep for four hours and have to work again. And he would stay at the plant because he can make triple time, because he's trying to take care of a family. So I come from a family that, listen, we believe, and actually the Bible teaches that, listen, if you want to eat, you should work. Okay? That is, I mean, it's scripture. And so, so the problem with me is, is that I like to work too much. I love work. I mean, I thrive in work. I like a wake-up work. That's why God gave me a wife that loves vacation. <laughs> she wakes up thinking vacation. She's on a perpetual vacation. She means, what, work? What's that? 
And so how do we know that we kind of like balance each other off, right? And so we've been married coming on 18 years. Come on, 18 years getting married, right? That great. And so it's so funny when God gives you another person like that is that you kind of just, and you people have been married a long time, you actually become more like your spouse and your spouse starts becoming more like you. Right, so I'm over there online just two days ago, and I found out, I say, Wendy, wow, there's this cruise line that, guess what, uh, I, I could get you to go free. It's two for one. And I'm, like, looking to book a cruise at the Caribbean. Yeah, and she goes, really? And then she starts kicking in Benny Perez mode. Well, how much is that going to cost? I'm like, I like, I like, babe, I mean, for $650, we can go on a cruise to the Caribbean, $650 for seven. How many of you want to go with me on the cruise right now? How about if I paid for it, you go with me right now? I'm not. I just want to see who, who, who the ones that wants to receive. So, so, so I, I tell you, because I don't, I don't come from a wealthy family in the natural but I do have a father that owns all the cattle on a thousand hills. Come on, I have a dad that owns all the silver and the gold. Come on, he's your father too if you're in Christ. So, so I, I don't want you to think that, ah, yeah, look, that guy has a silver spoon. And no, I, I, there's, no, there's no silver spoon in my mouth. And if you're a trust baby and, and God has blessed your family and you're generational wealthy, I don't think you should actually apologize for that. There's, there, listen. There's, there's no virtue in being poor. If there was, then they wouldn't want to get out of it. Poverty is a curse. It's a curse. And it's not solved by taking all the money from the rich and distributing it to everybody. I, I know that I'm going to get a little political here. I don't believe in socialism. I'm a capitalist through and through. And let me tell you, because Jesus was. Jesus tells a parable, and he says, let me tell you a parable. I, I, there was somebody that got this amount and this amount and this amount. One got one talent, one got three, one got five. And then the guy came back, and the five says, man, we multiplied it, and there's ten. He says, man, you're blessed. You're a good worker. The other one says, man, I went from three. I went to six. That's great. And then he went to the one that says, I hid your money, so I'm giving you back what you gave me. And he says, you wicked servant. And he took from the guy with one and gave it to the guy with ten. Okay, let's keep going. I don't, I don't know. You're all getting mad at me. Unless you think I am a minority. So don't throw the minority thing at me. Well, you're just a Caucasian. You know, I understand. And I don't believe that any man or woman makes me wealthy. I believe that God is the one that provides and increases my resources if I would put him first. Come on, you got to catch the spirit of what I'm saying. So as I end, somebody comes, comes here right now, comes here right now. And don't think that's a political statement on Democrats or Republicans. It's a statement of fact that I want to get people, quit looking at all that stuff and start putting God. What would you do if you looked at God? God knows that you're barely making it. And God is looking at you and will you trust me? I gladly, when we were younger, and I went, I took those food stamps. My family gladly, when somebody stepped up with generosity, and it was a mark on our family's life, when somebody paid three months back mortgage and three months ahead and, and saved our house, and God used them. I'm grateful for all that. But my dad said, you know what, thank you for that, but I will pay you back. And my dad paid them back. And my parents still live in that house today because my dad never stopped tithing and never stopped putting God first. And I'm here to tell you, when you put Oh, man. When you put God first, he will take care of you. Notice I didn't save the offering and tithing and generosity time till the end. Oh, he's setting us up now. Let's take the offering. No. Because you know what? I checked my motive. Would have been easy for me to change the worship experience. Let's do the generosity at the end. And God said, no. Let them get the revelation first. Let me plant the seed in them for a week first. Let them study my scripture first. Because it says in the Bible, don't give out of compulsion. Don't give because you're manipulated, but give with a cheerful heart. 
God's always about the motive. He's always about the motive. I'm not giving to God to become rich. I give to God because he's made me rich in every way. I'm talking about spiritually. I'm not giving to God so he can bless me. I give to God because he's already blessed me with Christ. When you take this position, the devil cannot steal from you. Because if you give like, okay, here I am. This is the lotto. I'm giving to God my tithe. The next week I'm going to get double. The devil's going to come to you and say, it didn't come. Quit tithing. I'm not tithing to be blessed. I'm tithing because God is the one who provides. God is the one that increases and produces generosity in me. Clap your hands really strong right now because there's an anointing. If you're a guest with this, you say, oh, man, I like the church the first two weekends, and bam, they got me on this one. Let me tell you what I say at this church. Nobody has to tithe. Nobody has to give anything. You can still come to this church. Tithing doesn't make you a better Christian. Tithing doesn't draw you closer to God. Tithing is something that is between you and God and acknowledges between you and God. God, you're my provider. When the recession hit many, about five years ago or 2008 now, it's time's going so fast, eight years ago, I had to get up and I still believe this. You may lose your job, you may lose your house, but you never lose your provider. We may have a rocky phys, uh, a financial year this year. I think the debt is out of control. I think you're seeing the stock market begin to, to, to shake and it dropped 400 points. I have, I have stocks in the stock market like some of you. I have mutual funds just like some of you. And seeing the stock market go almost to a 52-week low, and I started to feel my heart get a little anxious, I had to go back to the Word of God. The stock market is not my provision. Now, now do I have financial advisors? Yes. And, 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 and is it good to have wisdom? Yes. And, and, and so, you know, if it's going to be a bear market, then I'm investing in mutual funds that are actually short the market. So I did my research and I found five funds. I'm a smart man. And already one of those funds is up almost 20% since January. So there's a way to make money. I'm not, I'm not here if we just kind of God and we just, no. But there's wisdom. What I'm trying to tell you is, though, at the end of the day, God is still the one who provides for you.